Hey, hey, hey! Welcome! How's my hair look? How's my... It's, it's funny, we're talking about narcissism. <laughs> I'm doing a, doing a Facebook Live about narcissism, and the very first thing I do is, how does my hair look? Yeah. Um, I've been getting some DMs about my glasses. Uh, these are called swan, Swannies. Um, and uh, I get them because... I, I got them because... They block blue light. As you can see, it blocks blue light. <clears throat> and I'd be lying if I said that um, it didn't also look cool. And that's one of the main motivations. Hey, since we're talking about narcissism, I'm just, I've been doing a little bit of work on that dark pa the Dancing with the Dark Passenger, one of our uh, group calls today with my tribe, with my community. We we're talking about uh, the shadow part, the parts of us that we don't like, the parts of us that we hide and we try to compensate for, like the little part of me that feels like a failure. So I compensate by becoming overly successful. I have very low self-esteem, you know, that, you know, the guy, the cheesy guy with low self-esteem. So he buys like a super duper crazy ass, like excessively, massively, uh, uh, beautiful over-the-top car to con and uh, there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with having nice cars but the one that does it because they are fulfilling like uh, their low self-esteem that was me when I had my BMW first first chance I got I was still in debt coming out of school but I had to get the Beamer well because I'm partially because I'm Persian and that's just what Persians do, apparently. <laughs> it's like in our blood. Uh, but the other reason was because I didn't think that, um, you know, I was good enough. I didn't think that I was successful enough. And I'd always looked up to my mentors who had really nice cars. So I got a, uh, you know, so I got a BMW. And I was like, yeah, so you, you know, I got that as an accomplishment, as a, you know, like, good for you. And if you have a nice car that you've worked up to and got, great. The thing is, is though, is that I couldn't afford it. Like, I couldn't afford it outright, but I was just kind of like buying it just so that I could compensate for my, you know, low self-esteem. So <clears throat> I can see that now, but it took me, you know, four, I had at least four BMWs later. And then finally I was like, I started working online and I wasn't driving and I had like a, like a, like a $1,200 a month car payment. And it was just sitting in there, so I got resentful, and I said, "Screw this! I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a Prius." So I've been driving. I had been driving a Prius to, because I realized that I didn't need to, you know, as I continued to open my heart to myself, I didn't need to prove to myself worthy. And so, the reason why I'm sharing that is because we're talking about narcissism, and we're talking about the whole idea behind how to deal with the situation if you find yourself in one how to if you notice that you're following these patterns a lot of people have been messaging me uh, go, going I've been following your content and it and, and it, I'm ashamed to say but uh, I think that I'm a narcissist and I was like whoa okay cool I can relate <clears throat> um, first and foremost uh, my goal on this call on this uh, on this transmission is to help you dissolve any shame around having these traits and <clears throat> any shame around being with someone who has them has these traits because I don't believe in mental disorders as a classification uh, in the in kind of like pathologic pathologizing things I think that the medical system does a great job at trying to make you feel like you you have a pathology and so you're a victim of the some pathology which means you're the victim, this pathology is the perpetrator, like you have an illness, or they have an illness, and then you need medication, you need the doctor, you need somebody outside of you to rescue you. And I'm going to admit, I've met people, I know people, I'm related to people, who are pretty there around on the spectrum, and can you heal, can you not? I believe anyone can, but I don't believe any, uh, like everyone is ready. I believe everyone can if they're willing to look at themselves but it's there's huge blind spots we don't see our own blind spots I'm going to tell you about blind spots and so one of the problems with blind spots is when I expose a blind spot when you explode expose a blind spot to a narcissist the first thing they'll do is they will deny it 
the first thing they will do because of the shame of being a bad person <clears throat> is so paralyzing that they develop their narcissism to compensate with that shame because it was too disgusting to feel. To heal narcissism, you must be willing to own your shame of it. And by the end of this transmission, I'm going to reveal something to you that will partially trigger the hell out of you. Some, some of you, it will make you sick. You will have a great resistance to it. And I, I get it. But my certainty exceeds anyone's doubt about it because I know it very well. I've, I've experienced it. I've owned my own inner narcissist. My own, I call him my own inner Kanye. Um, we all have it. We all have it inside of us. If you don't see it and you're not okay with it, it's a part of you that you fractured, that was fragmented and fractured from childhood trauma. It's a part of you. You are whole and complete and you go through an event that has you not feeling seen, that has a, a feeling of trauma, of shame for being who you are, feelings of failure, that it causes you to fracture or fragment to create this sense of self externally. And you become hyper vigilant to, to creating this external sense of self, this need for recognition, this need for approval. I'm going to give six common traits of narcissistic people so that you can see where, where it all lands. And then I'm going to present you a very challenging proposition that will probably, it will either blow your mind or it will shut you down and say F you Nima, which I get. I got that once today actually on my group call. Um, one of the clients messaged me privately, fuck you Nima, and thank you slash fuck you Nima. And that's actually, a, you know, that's part of shadow work. That's how you know it's true. When you're doing the real healing work, you're exposing parts of you that's extremely uncomfortable. And you have to have somebody courageous enough to guide you there because you can't see your blind spot. So I'm going to hopefully show you a blind spot. I'd love for you to write in the comment section what has come up for you because my intent is healing. My intent is to serve and to heal. I am, I am interested only in conversations that involve healing. And unfortunately, the prevailing conversation about this narcissism codependency is completely incorrect. It actually does not facilitate healing. It perpetuates the drama triangle. And one of the, the, the greatest um, tra traits or trademarks of the narcissist is they're constantly playing victim. Please write that one down. Please kind of put that one on ice is they're constantly playing victim. Narcissists are perpetual victims. Remember that. I just want you to remember that. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Narcissists are perpetually victimizing themselves. That's what we do. Why? Because when we're younger and we lose our sense of self because of a parent that doesn't know how to attune to us, that doesn't know how to validate us, I never really, I, I didn't have often the experience of being having my reality validated by my mother. There was always, don't do that. No, you shouldn't feel that way. That's wrong. No, you can't have that. And I constantly had the experience of my reality not being validated. So naturally to a child, let me know if this resonates with you, but naturally to a child growing up and experiencing that from his mother and father, not having his reality validated, saying, I want to do this. No, you shouldn't do this. Go do that. And, and having a vision, having a dream, but having it constantly be told it's not valid. It's scary. Don't do it. All for love, all out of love, not because of cruelty, but because of concern, because of love, because of their fears, because of their traumas. I then grow up saying, okay, well then I'm, I'm in, my reality is not validated. I am insignificant because I couldn't get my mother and father to see me. Still to this day, I don't. My mom came over, it was awesome, great relationship with her now. It's much better. She still triggers the shit out of me. I notice it right away when I picked her up today. She came over, spent all this money grocery shopping so she can come and teach my wife how to cook. I took a picture. It's a beautiful moment. But the second that I opened the door and I kind of helped her up and brought up the stuff, she's like, you know what? Your father and I think you should sell this place. The markets are going to go down. You guys should buy a house. Now, 
that is purely out of love completely but I have my own plan I have my own vision and I have a different set of values I'm an investor I I want to invest this place I don't want to sell it because when we finally move out um, we'd be able to put it up on Airbnb but I, I don't have to explain I didn't want to justify or explain that my 12 year old 13 year old self inside of me kept wanted to go oh, mom I want to that's I don't want to I want to do this uh, like I can feel my body actually wanting to go to that hey Suzanne I could feel my body wanting to go into that but but I just saw it I was able to see it and 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 thank my mother for telling me what she thinks is best for me because the old per p part of me the one that never felt validated as a child that's my story wasn't validated didn't have my reality my choices were not nurtured and talked about it was always no you shouldn't do this this why my insignificance came up but this time I'm trigger proof to it <laughs> exactly Miranda this is for you now that I'm trigger proof to it I felt her as she was saying it I felt it come up and I saw it and I saw and I was able to regulate that and say thanks mom I really appreciate it and I gave her a big hug it was such an amazing time this the old version of me would not have been able to tolerate this I have a Persian mom Miranda you have a Greek mom so you get this if you have a Greek mom Persian mom <laughs> Asian mom <laughs> you tell me Italian mom tell me what kind of a mom you have alright so if I don't have that my insignificant button goes up and now what I do because that insignificance is so shameful because it's so painful I will hide it in my shadow because I don't want to feel it so I'm going to try to compensate by becoming super successful and significant look at me I'm Dr. Nima I have all these followers people love me people also hate me which makes me significant as well <laughs> and like I, I get to I get to you know I get to be I get to be important so I'm gonna do everything that I can in my life to try to battle and compensate for that insignificance and that feeling of nobody and be somebody because I wanna show that younger part of me that I've completely abandoned that I am somebody so then I will start to become self-serving my relationships will become transactional what can I get so that I can be significant. Ooh, my last relationship before I got married was a four-year codependent relationship that I used to judge going, why the hell was I with this? It was, she was crazy. Like it was nuts from the beginning and I could never bring her home to my mother. It was never from the start. But because of the skills that she had, not only was I really addicted to the kind of sexuality aspect of it as most trauma bonds are, but I could actually use her to become more significant. Okay? That is a classic narcissistic trait. That was how I was operating in my relationships. And so the thing is, is that now that I've come on the other side, I've been able to look at it and just see, like after my collapse happened, and I had to actually sit in the shame of everything and go, all right, it's time for you to, you know, stop trying to pretend like you're significant, <laughs> to try to meet with that, to try to merge, to, to, to try to compensate for your paralyzing insignificance. It's time for you to work on the little boy that felt insignificant. Because if you don't, because you not having taken responsibility and playing victim to your parents, has now led you to a place where you're not able to have a healthy relationship and that was my wake-up call oftentimes when you're in narcissism you will not wake up to it until you have a massive collapse some people will have a divorce and they still won't wake up then you go to the second divorce you still don't wake up so I'm gonna I'm gonna set you free from this pattern would that be valuable for you Here's the question that you have to ask yourself. 
are you willing to be triggered and uncomfortable in order to heal? Because you will not heal unless you're willing to be uncomfortable. This isn't kind of like energy tapping and tap those feelings away. No, no, no. This is let's sit and get really uncomfortable and tell the truth because nothing is more uncomfortable than the truth. Yet, if you're willing to tolerate the discomfort, it will set you free. That's what being trigger proof is about. I tolerated some discomfort with my mother today, felt it all, and I was able to kind of move it through my body and have an amazing time with her, you know? And I love her, and it was like, oh my God, she's so sweet. She spent like 150 bucks grocery shopping, came in and taught my wife some of my most amazing recipes that I love growing up. Like, and I'm looking at it while I'm doing my group call, and I'm like watching, going, wow, this is a real... This is a real sign, first of all, number one, that I'm in a healthy relationship because I never, I was never able to have that before I started doing exactly what I'm about to share with you today. And number two, that, I, that, that my relationship with my mom and, and m- my wife's relationship with my mom is so good. This has never happened before either because I kind of kept them apart because there was so much conflict and because of the inauthenticity of it all. But now there's nothing to hide. There's no truths that I'm withholding. So there's the energy between us. There's no inauthenticity. There's no incongruency. If you can't bring your partner around family, there's something in your body that is looking to get out that you're not facing. And it's uncomfortable. You'll start making excuses and blame this person, that person, this person, or because of this. But the truth is, you're not able to connect because of the feelings in your body won't allow you. You haven't yet learned how to to integrate them. You haven't yet learned how to heal those parts of you. I'm going to talk about that. So let's go over a few traits of what a narcissist is and then I'm going to talk a little bit about if you have any questions go ahead and ask and if anything like what I'm saying is resonating what I'll get you to do is write it in the comment section because I can't see you. So normally when I'm speaking to a live audience, it's a, it's a two-way conversation. Even though you might not be talking, your facial expressions tell me if something's landing. So I, I, I don't know. I really, uh, I don't, it's not that I need your approval, although that always feels good too to my narcissistic part. Uh, if, I could, if I could hear and, and get you to engage with what I'm saying, oh, that landed, what about this, ask a question then I'll be able to help you. I'll be able to help because my goal here is to connect you with your truth so that you can then take the necessary steps to put down the victimhood and actually take ownership to heal those those wounds because the future of humanity depends on it. <laughs> families, I, families, the work that you do can heal an entire, your whole family. We have evidence of this in our program, in our group. This Laura who was with an abusive ex-husband, divorce lawyers, police, all of this was involved, tens of thousands of dollars. And then today she had a conversation with him or yesterday or whatever, conversation with her ex and said, hey, let's do this without lawyers after a three-year battle costing tens of thousands. And he was like, okay. And she, she's like, there was a beautiful moment and he was like he was the perpetrator before and he she told us she told the whole she's like he was scared of me and I'm like yes I know you didn't see it because you were so busy in your victimhood and I'm not blaming you this is not about victim blaming a lot of you a lot of you who are listening might really take what I'm saying to heart as a huge offense because it seems like I'm blaming the victim because they were so horrible to you and this and that and this but pay attention step back I want you to I want you to really see this because my hope for you is that you have a secure attachment. You won't be able to have a secure attachment with somebody in the future if you're still carrying around an old identity, an old story that has you so disempowered. You're just going to find the next one to treat you in the same way unless you empower yourself. So this journey, this conversation is just about healing and empowerment. That's all I want for you. Okay, so some traits of narcissism. Number one, lies and exaggerations. Why? Why do they lie and exaggerate? Because they're monsters. Well, that's one way of looking at it from the perspective of the victimhood. 
but from the perspective of trauma, from the perspective of uh, childhood wounding, when do we lie and when do we exaggerate? When we feel ashamed of who we are. It takes kind of the, when you look at it that way, it takes the monster away from them. That's what I'm trying to do. The less of a monster you see, the more wounded child you see, the more empowered you are because you're not a victim to somebody else's monsterhood, you can now see your power where you completely gave it up. Because that's one of the key, pa the word power is going to be big in this. So number one, lies and exaggerates. Number two, rarely admits flaws. Oh, this, you know, it's cute, it's my mom. I'm like, mom, you weren't listening for the last 10 minutes. I was listening. What are you talking about? I always listen. Lies, exaggeration, rarely admits flaws, <laughs> and highly aggressive when criticized. What are you talking? And then boom, comes right back at me with it. Okay. All right. And I can relate because I used to be that way too. And it's hard for me to be criticized. It still hurts, especially... Um, when I'm teaching about triggers and I have content that's triggering, well, to see how uncomfortable you are in this conversation. Watch how uncomfortable you're about to get. What I'm about to tell you is you're not going to like it. It should make you sick. That's how you know it's getting, it's true. If it makes you sick, then you know that there's truth there. That's a good telltale sign. I usually go and, oh God, that's making me sick. Keep it coming because I know there's freedom on the other side. I'm not afraid of that. That's called shame. The whole foundation of all of this is shame. So rarely admits flaws and highly aggressive when criticized. Um, there's a false image projection. Okay, it's like they 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 put on a show externally. I know I know this. <laughs> they put on a show. Look at our great life externally. That's what I used to do with my ex too. Look at us having this amazing life, but behind the scenes, it's all a bunch of hocus pocus baloney. Uh, number four, violating boundaries. That's a key sign of narcissistic trait. Number five, emotional invalidation. They invalidate you constantly. They invalidate your feelings constantly. And number six, manipulation using guilt, blame, and victimhood. Manipulation using guilt, blame, and victimhood. So those are the six traits. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind, but it's going to set you free. If you continually keep attracting narcissistic people and you are complaining, I get these messages all the time, my husband's a narcissist. The question you want to ask is this, and it's going to bother you. Why am I a perfect match for a narcissist? Why? Why, for the last 30 years, have we been perfectly matched? The answer is because you are both two sides of the same exact coin, mirrors to one another. And the moment you're able to embrace your narcissism, like I was doing earlier today, by the way, just me talking about this, okay? was me doing that's shadow work this conversation is shadow work this conversation is what I call dancing with the dark passenger embracing my inner Kanye because if I can't see it and I deny it that's a classic sign of a narcissist is an, a narcissist is one who cannot see that they are and they would never admit it now I'm about to tell you something that's gonna sound like victim blaming but it's not because there's no one to blame. I want you to. I want. I want to start this context off by saying, you're not toxic. There's no one to blame. There's nothing to be ashamed about, because we adapted to be this way. Okay. Just like the, me growing up had to face my own insignificance, and I created a persona of power, external power, and external validation, seeking it, whatever in order to deal with my insignificance, why is a narcissist, why, why are you a perfect match for one? It's because you have the exact same, I'm gonna use this dysfunction, but flipped on its other side. 
you also have insignificance that you haven't dealt with. And your insignificance is perfectly matched with that other, your partner, your narcissistic partner's insignificance. It's just expressed in different ways. So the narcissist expresses their insignificance by, by grandiosity and to put out the project, projection of uh, importance, relevance, significance, whatever. The opposite end of the spectrum, which we will call the codependent, feels their insignificance so they can gather significance by plugging into somebody of that opposite energy pole as a perfect match. And here's the crazy part. The, the narcissist is a closet, co closet covert codependent because they are so weak and needy if they don't have that approval from that from the many they become codependent on the approval of the many let me know if you know what I'm talking about here and the codependent is are you ready for this let me know if this hurts a little is a closet narcissist that's right the codependent is a closet narcissist who is gathering all this relevance and importance because of their own deep inner insignificance are meeting with someone who treats them just as insignificantly as they feel about themselves. Does that make sense? And there's nothing to be ashamed of. This is a epidemic. I figured it out. As soon as I unpack this and I'm like, oh my God, I'm a narcissist. <gasps> I'm also codependent. Oh my God. She's been calling me a narcissist. She can't see her narcissism. My inbox is flooded. Actually, there's one woman who's been messaging me. I don't want to name names. She's probably going to watch this, and that's okay. Wake up calls are good. This is the classic conversation that happens with a codependent who's been complaining about a narcissist. Watch this. Check this out. My husband's a narcissist. Can I tell you my story? Which is exaggeration which will be an exaggeration which won't admit any of the flaws when and when I say well no I'd, I'd have you challenge on that point of view and they completely come back no that's not it highly aggressive back to me when criticized false image projection I'm a I'm a I'm just giving I'm just so loyal and giving boundary violation which is let me tell you, let me take up your time to constantly tell you my story and exaggerate my own significance and my own relevance and trample over your boundaries that said, please don't share with me your story unless you have an absolute desire to heal from it. I'm not here. Don't share with me, please, because I, I now have, as soon as I hear a, a woman or sometimes a man too, but it's mostly say, my husband's a narcissist. I know that I'm dealing with a covert narcissist who doesn't know it. And if I were to suggest it, they behave exactly like a narcissist would. They accuse me of victim blaming. Ah, oh, I'm a victim, which is classic narcissistic. Emotionally invalidating me and my, excuse me, these are my boundaries. Just because you watch my videos on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube doesn't entitle you to my time and I've told you no I don't want to hear your story please book a call with Kim and have her talk about it with you and I'm very clear on these boundaries now because they I had to put them up because I was dealing with narcissists in codependent clothing <laughs> violating my boundaries so I had to put up boundaries I don't want to hear the story and completely emotionally invalidating this is what it will sound like I'll be like yes I understand your husband was this and that is terrible terrible and there's something in there for you to heal so if you're actually interested in healing this is here's a link this is where I would suggest that you go here's a link and then the very next thing it's like they didn't even see or hear what I said. They just keep going with their story. It's like, oh my goodness, like, 
just reading and then I show I show Diana I show my wife I'm like look she goes she's watching she goes you set your boundary to her again and again and she literally steps over it she completely emotionally invalidated you and exaggerated her own relevance my friend you're not able to see that you yourself the thing that you're pro it's called projection the shadow part of us the narcissistic part of us that we all have myself included I'm not saying we all have it if you can't see it and you haven't integrated it and you haven't dealt with your own insignificance it's gonna be dormant in your shadow you can't see it and then you're gonna attract it in a partner who keeps invalidating you and causing you to feel that same familiar feeling of insignificance that you felt in childhood and you're gonna wanna be validated and you're gonna wanna send can I send you this is what they this is what I get a lot this is what I get constantly can I send you screen captures of my conversations I want you to see some of the things he's saying to me in other words I need you to validate me isn't this what narcissists do isn't this what the thing that your partner that you're pointing the finger at your partner and I'm not saying he's a fucking angel far from but he's not the one coming to me he's not the one coming to me for help so I have no interest in fixing anybody who's not coming to your coming to me for help for help when in fact you're just coming to me for validation which is a classic sign of narcissism which is totally okay because we have it but it's a blind spot and unless you can admit it yourself you are becoming exactly what you resent in the other person let me know if this is resonating with you and it should bother you a little bit just notice how uncomfortable you are notice how you want to tell me to fuck off I get it it's part of my job is, is that fun what do you do for the work well I call people forward I'm a facilitator of healing and a facilitator of healing is not about sunshines and puppy dogs and rainbows no it's about going into the dark is about being willing to f tell the truth but I can't see the truth I know no you can it's you're just too ashamed of it and it takes somebody outside of you you trust that's why you can't get this on a podcast and you can't get it from a counselor who's just gonna support your story oh see you next week let me tell you how terrible your partner is I had a client come in to see me with he was the codependent in a narcissistic relationship okay and he's gone to a counselor for two years and all the counselors doing is your wife is a total narcissist your wife is a total narcissist and he comes to me he's like looking for help and I'm like watch this video and then he finishes watching my trigger trigger proof training I said what'd you get out of it he goes I'm a narcissist too and I'm like good you're ready to heal until you're able to own that there is no healing you are hit it is hidden in your shadow it's hidden in your shame it's something completely shameful about you your insignificance it's it's you you have no no access to healing it it's deep in your shadow you can't see it so you get one partner after another who's a narcissist that constantly has you feeling insignificant it's two pole two opposites of a pole of duality completely I want everyone to know I'm I'm significant prove it to me and then I want to prove to the world I'm significant narcissist and then the codependent which is oh, I'm always insignificant I'm just nobody cares about me I'm nothing I'm pathetic right I'm so uh, somebody needs to come and rescue me help me I keep attract rescue me I keep attracting narcissists okay uh, instead of rescuing you how about teach you how to rescue yourself okay great where do I begin look in a mirror put down the magnifying glass pick up a mirror and you're gonna ask you're gonna say where am I being narcissistic where am I lying and exaggerating my part of the story no I don't yeah your ego doesn't want to see it it's there your shadow lies and exaggerates if you're unaware of it it's if you can't see it it's literally running you okay if you can't see it it's probably running you you rarely admit flaws and highly aggressive I'm not a narcissist no I'm not how dare you say it you're victim blaming okay take a look at the mirror look at your I just 
pointed something out and look at your reaction to it. Okay, maybe something to look at. This is how healing happens when you're willing to have a conversation with somebody who's brave enough to call you out and not just be like, see the thing is the counselor can't call you out because then you can write a letter to the board and then they'll get in trouble. So they're just going to be like, oh, poor you. I feel for you. He's terrible. He was terrible to you. Nobody deserves it. High five, girl. See you next week. Two years later and you're still telling the same fucking story. I asked my my buddy, I said, why do you want to work with me now? Why don't you go to your counselor? He goes, I've been going two years, same thing. And I, I need to be called out. I'm like, okay, all right, you're ready. Because it's painful when you look at yourself. But the pain is a necessary. The pain is a purifier. We must own our shadow. We must feel it, face it, feel it. The healing comes from owning your insignificance and healing the attachment wounds that caused us to feel so insignificant. I had to look and go, all right, I'm showing up as the narcissist. All right, I see it. I got it. I'm narcissist in this relationship. I've been codependent in the other. All right, I own it. The second you own it, you cease to be a narcissist. Think about that. The second you can truly own this, the second that we truly own this, we stop being a narcissist because narcissists cannot own it. If you're like, I cannot be a narcissist, there's no way. You might be a narcissist. Not with a capital N medical, you know, like diagnosis. No, I'm not saying NPD. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about traits. I'm talking about adaptations to trauma. That's right, Christiana. You have to feel we have to take responsibility for our choices, actions, thoughts, and beliefs when we do our life changes along with our... We can do healthy self-love and boundaries. Absolutely. We can. But you got to be willing to heal those old attachment wounds. you got to be willing to own the fact that when you get triggered, you check out. you got to be willing to own the fact that you're not able to regulate yourself around your parents. I know that feeling. And when it happened after my last breakup, I knew what, what I had to do. I moved back in with them and actually sat in the soup of my discomfort and my triggers and literally lived in the not feeling seen and being invalidated. And I found validation for myself throughout all that. It's kind of like going to, you know, going to uh, Iraq for the Iraq war, having a bunch of PTSD, going back home to the United States, and then on your healing journey, Deciding to go back to Iraq while there's explosions and war going on and choosing to do your healing there. I don't recommend it, but I was pretty committed. And I was like, I don't care. I think I don't, I don't care what it takes. I want to have a healthy relationship. That's my number one goal. I want to become the kind of person who can actually have a woman feel nourished in a relationship rather than resentful and angry all the time at me. I want to feel like I was seen and not like I was a hero rescuer, like I had to fix somebody all the time. I just wanted somebody who felt like, you know, responsible for their own emotions. You know, I just stopped repeating the cycles with my mother. I healed those attachment wounds. And when you do, you stop attracting the same type of partner. So I was in the narcissistic codependent cycle. A, I was in the narcissistic codependent cycle and I saw where I played both roles. I saw where I played the codependent. I saw where I played the narcissist. And that's okay because every unconscious relationship is that way. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You, there, I, I just want you to release the shame of it, right? And enter the conversation of healing. So let me know what came up for you um you know what you do yeah so what do you do how to deal with this you empower all areas of your life you heal your attachment wounds that part of you you ask the question where did i get my sense of insignificance from where did that begin when i ask you that question go ahead and write it in the comment section where did i decide that i was insignificant and own it that's where you begin so that's how you deal with that and i'm not saying that they're innocent uh, well sorry i'm not saying that it's your fault it's their fault yes of course they could use some help too but they're not the ones reaching out to me that's why so 
you who's been arguing with me about or in my inbox telling me your stories about your narcissistic husband and how he cheated and lied and all of this scroll up right now and just reread it from this lens of how often I told you I'm sorry I appreciate your story one of them actually said can we go out for coffee I want to talk to you about this and I'm like wait a second you're some person off the internet why do you feel entitled to me taking to, to you taking me out to a coffee so that you could tell me your problem like I was just sitting there going entitled which is <laughs> yeah boundary violation boundary violation several times I was like excuse me no several times I said please please no stepped over consistently because you just had to tell me your story about your narcissistic husband and you had zero desire to actually receive help for it you just wanted to be validated often these types of th this type of kind of question that comes in my inbox doesn't even come as a question one long ass story and then I'll be like this cool sorry how can I help you is there a question oh how do you heal that and then I'll send a link I'll be like here's several several of my free content when you're ready here's the link to my event the overview experience that's coming up on the September 27th where you're gonna actually learn how to take responsibility for your role in the dynamic to empower yourself to heal the attachment wound to be able to patch up that sense of insignificance that has you consistently finding the same type of person again and again and again but this this work is not for everyone you must be empowered enough in yourself to be able to make that choice for you to be able to invest in yourself most of the time when you're in that deep space of of unconsciousness and there's no shame about this you have disempowered yourself so much that you can't even do something for your own health and well-being unless you get permission from this narcissist how your work is to discover how without shame how you ended up in that situation because if you're telling me your story so that he can be fixed and I can say oh man what an asshole why don't you go to your girlfriends and tell them probably you have and they're tired of hearing your story it's quite isolating when you can keep going around telling people your victim story you are draining their energy you're just like depleting them which is a boundary violation which is a narcissistic behavior and there's no shame in that it's just to look at if I'm telling you this and it's triggering you this sh and, it, and it's hurting you good not in a damaging way but pain of of experiencing and exposing our shame is how we heal from narcissism we have to feel shame shame is 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 blocked by the narcissist so we have to embrace the shadow the disgusting bah! oh my god did I really show up that way ah and sit in it and feel it and then once you feel it see you cannot shift it until you admit it let me say that again if you can't admit to it you can't shift it you're just avoiding it it's like oh the stove the kitchen stove is on fire I'm not gonna look at it it's on fire I'm not gonna look at it I'm not gonna look at it I gotta look and go oh the stove is on fire I'm gonna go grab some you know extinguisher and get to work but I have to look at the fire first I have to admit that it's there you must admit it first to shift it does that resonate with you yeah thank you need to bring our conscious level first we have to take responsibility for yeah thank you for the commentary Christiana it sounds like you're a coach and you you wanna um, kind of add some footnotes in there hundred percent hundred percent true so let me know if you have any questions about this what came up for you um, if what I'm saying resonates with you and you're feeling sick by it 
there's a sign that's a sign it's your higher self your soul calling for the truth and even though it's going to be painful it will it will set you free and this isn't for everyone you have to be willing to give up your victim story you have to be willing to be the one be the change but why me why don't they do it they're the fucked up ones yeah I get it but consider the possibility they are just as you are a kind of part of an intergenerational trauma cycle that didn't start with you and it's been spreading virally from your parents invalidating you children are to be seen not heard listen to us we're your parents egocentric narcissistic parenting that has you feeling insignificant that you have to kind of act out for your significance look at me and then attract codependent partners or you know feel that insignificance find somebody with significance that you can kind of you know be one of those what are those animals that kind of leech off of the the barnacle is it a barnacle or whatever you just plug into somebody with power to get their credibility to get their whatever it is to get a need met there's a need that you're getting met by dating this type of person you get significance my ex um, admitted she I, I was her ticket out she had she has a had at the time a business uh, as a madam and a uh, former uh, sex worker and a exotic dancer and that was intriguing to me and uh, we started a relationship and she was like oh this is my way out of it she admitted that and you know which was it worked so she got her needs met and then I did too I can see that now I don't judge myself and I don't judge her I see myself as unconscious and I had to dissolve some of the shame for that that's why I'm having this conversation with you because if you can relate to me and you're having a lot of shame please understand that that's normal we we're hiding pretending lying because we deep down feel insignificant and unworthy and so our healing works our healing is to address that part of us and to learn tools and skills to be able to keep resourcing whenever that comes up because it's going to come up again and again it's going to be triggered right so that's why I call it trigger proof it's the skill of taking a trigger and being able to neutralize it into self-love and alchemize it and integrate it and to take any conflicts that we have and turn it into deeper intimacy those two skills that I'm that I dedicated my life to learning have been responsible for me feeling safer in my body being able to be authentic and tell the truth feeling like I'm in a flow state with my life like I don't I don't um, script if you haven't if you haven't get if you haven't uh, figured out by now I don't script these I'm in flow so by learning how and and that's specifically designed as a methodology that I teach at the overview experience in how to integrate all of those shadows into getting into the body when it doesn't feel safe body-based integration that has you move energy through your body and get into flow so that you can stand in front of a camera and tell the truth and feel confident spe speaking your voice and not have and, and confident not because you're putting on a confident front although these glasses do do the trick because I do let's face it I look cool with them on I, I, I acknowledge that what I'm saying is you actually are being confident rather than trying to be to, rather than acting confident you know what I mean you won't have to fake it when you do this fake it till you make it is fine but when you do this you won't have to fake it because you're too busy in it you're too busy being in it so that is coming up on the September 27th I am gonna give you a link in the comment section or if you're on YouTube watching on replay check in the box there make sure you subscribe make sure if you know somebody I want you to invite in my Facebook group trigger proof Facebook group go ahead in and and invite five people or two people or the one person or a group of people that you know really need to hear this because they're constantly in the same cycle having the same argument playing the same story on repeat it's not their fault it's in their body they need and counseling talk therapy won't work it requires you to confront those shadows and to to heal those unconscious wounds and it's a daily practice you're there's no teacher that's going to rescue you 
No, I don't. I, it's you. Re we require guides to lead us back to ourselves to be our own hero. Don't stop looking for something outside of you. It's really about empowering you, owning your shadow, and healing what's caused you to be insignificant. So I'm going to leave the link in the comment section. Check it out. And I do recommend, uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'd love to answer and uh, maybe even create a, a content for you, a content piece, like a, a video. So um, I just want to say I'm super grateful that you're here. The fact that you're in my universe, whether you're on YouTube, whether you're Facebook Live, um, it means a lot because this is probably the most important conversation. It's meaningful to me. And the reason why is because I am now dedicated to raising my child, let's do any day now, with instilled with confidence in themselves. So for me, if I don't feel my own significance and I haven't healed that, then I'm going to use my child to validate my own significance. Okay? And you know exactly what that feels like to have a parent try to do that. It invalidates you. And breaks you from your significance which causes you to get into toxic codependent narcissistic cycles like I did and so I want to liberate you from that which is painful and it's exhilarating and the rewards are definitely worth it Laura basically before she began working with us uh, she was dating a guy and he was like up to here he's like listen you're getting too needy I don't I, it's too much work uh, you don't have your shit together I don't think this is gonna work between us and she was like give me a few months and she jumps in and starts working with us and she starts to heal her victim story her little entitled boundaryless victim story all about me my own significance she actually saw her abusive ex-husband and saw that she was playing a story and saw how she was trying to rescue and he was trying to rescue and saw the humanity in it and today after a few months completely transformed that conversation and is now going to save thousands of dollars in legal fees because they're actually going to work it out and she admitted that she was using police and lawyers because she didn't feel safe and she told him that and he started crying and he was like I've been scared of you and she's like what this abuser that I've been calling narcissistic abuser was actually scared of me and I see why I, I violated him wow she owned her shadow and now her kids are doing better and she's gonna save a shit ton of money in the in the divorce proceedings imagine that like wow and the kids who wins the kids the kids win the kids win because then she can stop the cycle and here's what happened here's the best part a week ago her partner who currently who was like, I don't know if I'm ready. I think we need some space. Da 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 da. He was like, So, are you gonna get? Are we gonna get married? When are you? Are you gonna get get married? He basically kind of proposed to her, and she's like, What the hell? She, she was because she knew she knew she had to heal her attachment wounds, and she did. And now, she's got healing with her ex. Her career has is starting to skyrocket, and now she has a. Um, documentary coming out ironically about reconciliation between men and women violence between men and women reconciliation and she's like holy crap I feel congruent sharing this message because she's now living the work watch she's gonna she's gonna be she's gonna be pretty this is gonna be pretty big if she can keep her ego in check right Laura if you can just keep your ego in check said the narcissist <laughs> so essentially um, I love this work. It means a lot to me. Um, when you're a part of our community, um, you get your ass kicked. You'll probably tell me to F off. It's okay. It's nothing but love there. And you will have like, wow, like this is the greatest act of self-love you can do is to heal your attachment wounds. And it's a, it is a absolute um, privilege for me to be your guide on the side for that. And if you feel called and compelled, I'm going to leave a link down there, and I'd love it for you to join us on September the 27th. Now, it's five hours long, and one caveat. If my wife goes into labor, I have to cancel it. That's my only thing. I'm just warning you in advance, preparing everybody, because it's literally due any day now. 
So between now and then, October 3rd is the due date. So it could happen. So I might not make it, but you'll don't worry. We will postpone it, refund whatever you want. If you don't want to, you know, wait for the next one, it doesn't work for you, no problem. But I have a money back guarantee on this one that you are going to have a magical experience and if you're not satisfied with it the time that you're spent you don't feel that you got what you wanted out of it there's a full money back guarantee no questions asked that's how confident and heart open heart centered uh i'm working well oh, there's a moth there's a lot of moths here have you noticed in vancouver if you're in vancouver it's like moth central they're everywhere yikes they're going to eat my clothes. Anyway, um, let me know if that resonated with you. And uh, yes, I'll follow the link in the comments section and we'll see you at the next perfect time.